cover one aspect of biodiversity. There will be two more presentations following in some time from now that will uh, uh, cover other aspects of biodiversity. Uh, but Lou and I uh, are the guys that, for a living, look at species diversity in the marine environment. And we both work at the ARC, as it's affectionately known, the Atlantic Reference Center, for those of you that don't know, which is just up the hill here and is a cooperative venture between the Huntsman and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans since 1984. So, uh, what I'm trying to do here tonight is, is four things together with Lou. One is I want to talk to you about a really massive project that you may have heard about which is known as the Census of Marine Life. And it's, it's without equal. Nothing like that has ever been attempted. So I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about that. It's huge. One can't cover it possibly. Then I want to focus a little bit on uh, one particular project within the Census that you and I have been personally involved with. And that gives it a little bit of local context. And last, or second last, I should say, is a very recent uh, paper that has come out, a landmark paper, that finally gives us some idea on just how many different life forms or species there are on this planet. This is something that uh, scientists have been struggling with for a long time. We don't have the exact number, but we have a much better idea now on where we are with this. And this changed dramatically since the end of the census, which was 2010, and the appearance of this paper in 2011. And then the last part of the show, and certainly not the least, is really to learn about the diversity, the distribution, and the abundance of marine life, not only in the present, but also in the past, <coughs> and potentially what it will be like in the future. And this whole effort was based on 17 global projects seven of which actually had major Canadian input. <coughs> Just some of the statistics that give you an indication of the size of this project. It uh, was at the core funded by the uh, Sloan Foundation to the tune uh, of $75 million. But once you added up all the co-funding from the different nations, the ships that went out there, and all of this, kind of activity, it had up to something around $650 million, a very large project. So after 10 years, they have over 2,600 scientific papers that have been published. Um, a number of special collections of papers were published, including the, what's known as the Closed or Public Library of Science. That means this type of material is available to anybody. You can get on the net and find all the papers that we wrote on this project. The most important uh, contribution to me is what's known as OBIS, or the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. And that is basically <coughs> knowing what species live where in the world, ready at the click of a mouse. And this is just an amazing feat that the census helped to establish. This map is probably one of my favorite things about the census because it shows us just what the world looks like once we take the waters away and you can sort of divide the ocean up into three convenient units if you wish. One is what you see here in pink that is basically the continental shelf. It's the extension from the land into the sea and around our next it's just off Nova Scotia, a day's worth of travel with a boat. That usually is quite flat, but no more than 200 meters. But then you get this amazing big drop off. And this is known as the continental slope. This is just like on a ski hill going at a very steep angle down. And you go from 200 to over 1,000 meters very quickly in terms of a horizontal distance. This makes it usually interesting in terms of distribution of animals because they vertically stratify themselves along this very deep gradient. Then you have all the blue stuff. So this is known as the abyssal plain. 
which I think is a bit of a no misnomer because it's not really a plane in terms of being flat. Sure, there are flat areas, but there are a lot more mountains than there are flat areas. And uh, it includes the longest mountain range in the world, of course, which is the Mid Atlantic Ridge. So it really gives you a good impression of what things look like underwater once you take um, the water away. It gives you a much better idea of what the marine environment looks like. This particular slide is only meant to show you where in the world the sense of marine life was active. So down here are all the colors for the 17 different projects. There's really no sense in going over the details. But what it shows is the census was really active globally. And I guess maybe the other thing you can take out of it is that the polar regions were of particular interest because so little work has been done there. And similarly for the deep uh, sea region. What the uh, census was able to do is get as many partners together as possible that specialize in various aspects of exploration. So this included the traditional type of work that I've been doing often, which is quad rats on the shallow waters, and you go down and see what's in there, to boats that have trawls. But it includes also some rather high-tech things, such as remotely operated vehicles, that went right down to the hydrothermal vents. And what is probably one of the really interesting things now in terms of technology is acoustic curtains that are deployed on the bottom of the ocean. So every time something swims past these curtains, it gets recorded. And that way you can really find out what goes where. And what is, that is meant to show is basically what, where we have information now. And the, all the blue areas that you see there are things that that existed before the data were there, but they were basically put together, compiled by the census, and then made available through this OBIS that I told you about. The yellow areas, it's basically a mix of that plus OBIS uh, partners that, that got these types of information. But what's worth uh, more than the others, I think, are all the red areas, because those represent information from areas where we had none before. So it really shows how much uh, that particular project has contributed to increasing our understanding of the ocean. Now, a little bit more about this OBIS thing, because one of the things you can do is just go online and you just type in the name of a particular species and out comes the map. It shows you where that particular species occurs. You can actually then click on the particular points that tells you where those uh, pieces of information came from. This is the Gulf of Mexico, so Florida right here. And in 2009, the census actually obtained a baseline of what you find in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, very, very detailed, it's, it's over a 1,000 page publication that allows us to have a baseline in terms of what is found in the Gulf. Why is that important? Because right up here is where we have the big oil spill, not too long after that. So what is being done right now is to see even how things have changed. And we can do that because we have the baseline information. So there is a practical example on how this baseline information can come in for us to understand environmental impact. This is another depiction of the world, if you wish, that is quite interesting because it is based on all the information that we have in this ocean biogeographic information system. And if we look at it, and we're basically looking down to the North Pole here in terms of the world view, North America is right around here, the colors tell you basically how much information we have in a particular area. And if it's red, then there's a lot it's yellow, we have some, and if it gets darker and darker in terms of blue color, we have less and less. And if it's white, there isn't any. So it's astounding to know that even in today's age, there are areas in the world where we don't know anything. If you look in terms vertically, in terms of depth, we, have, we know quite a bit in terms of near shore, because of course that's where we live and where we work. 
and we also know a fair amount on the ocean surface, and then maybe also along the bottom. There's this huge void, which represents actually the largest habitat on Earth, the midwater level of the oceans, where we have the least amount of information. The census tells us what the knowledge gaps are, you know, where we need to do some more work. Finally, and, and it's still on this obus thing, um, what this actually represents are, if you wish, biogeographic regions or marine biomes, as it's called here. But what it's based on is simply the information that is in Obus on what species are found where, and then in comparing this to other regions, they actually do fall out naturally into 39 large-scale regions. This is very interesting because it's not based on marine currents. It's not based on any oceanographic information. It's only based on what species they're found in the world. And they yet fall out very nicely into very specific regions. So this can be very useful in terms of our understanding of the ocean. Well, we have to talk a little bit about historical changes too. And one of the very interesting things, remember I was telling you that the census also looked at the past, not just the present. Uh, the swordfish is a, is a very good example here because it shows that the impact on large fish fisheries uh, was already quite dramatic before the present time. So, uh, swordfish in the, in the 1860s, on average, if I got this right, weighed 270 kilograms. So times 2.2, that's almost like 550 pounds. It was a big fish. By the 1930s, this was down to 100. So you can see that they already have a decline historically. In the Florida Keys, and it is one of the outfits where you can go fishing. And in 1958, this is the typical catch that you got. You see these big groupers. I mean, this grouper is bigger than that, that man right here. And that very same marina in 2007, that's what they were catching. This is my very favorite picture on the census. Because to me, it embodies and symbolizes what we have to do. Basically, we have to start with our kids. If we don't get them interested, they are not going to care. I mean, they are adults. So, we have to start with the young generation. If you have not had the chance to see this movie, you can get it now. It's known as Oceans. Galate Film Productions did this, and it was basically through the census that this film happened. It's, it's a very wonderful story without much talking at all. It basically just shows you what that environment is like much better than we can do here. It's uh, quite, really quite an amazing film if you get a chance to see it. I would really encourage you to. The age of discovery really is not over. We have so many species out there that we don't know about. And this is true even of something like fish.